So to review, Japan's democracy faces problems, certainly. It faces these issues, but it's going to be working on them with democratic means. So it helps to kind of divide them into domestic and foreign. Domestically, there is this issue of growing rural poverty. There is also urban unrest, particularly among workers, and it's interesting that they might join together. So if you look on the left, you can see that there's a poster with a farmer and a industrial worker. And as you can see from the caption there, this is from 1928. It is for the Labor Farmer, Farmer Party. And it says, give the workers food and work. Guarantee land for the cultivators, right? And that goes to those issues we've been talking about. Problems with wages, with unemployment, and how it was becoming easier for farmers to lose their land. And then it says liberty for all the people. So we want more democracy. And this is an example of people willing to work within the system, in a sense, right? This is a politician who is openly advertising. So this isn't a, a radical person who wants to overthrow the government. It's someone who wants certain reforms. But the key thing is that there are reforms, that, or there, there's problems that people are reacting to, and they're calling for change. There's also the issue of population growth. That's one reason why there is growing poverty, because the Japanese population is getting larger, but in this time period, there's limited resources, limited jobs in Japan itself. And that's related to Japan lacking a lot of important natural resources. Japan really, for example, doesn't have much oil. And in particular, it's not sufficient in self-sufficient in food. There's just not enough food at this time that can be grown in Japan. So Japan is, there's always this kind of concern. We don't have the resources, we don't, especially food. And as we mentioned before, even though there's room for people who might be on the political left, there is no room for, for communists and people who have other radical ideas that want to change the fundamental system. In terms of foreign concerns, there is the fear of the Soviet Union. It's communist and it's becoming more powerful. And uh, Russia had been expanding into Asia previously and a more powerful replacement of Russia, the Soviet Union, is going to be able to do that better. So there's this concern, uh, this fear of the rising power of the Soviet Union. And also, as we'll talk about, there's fears about what to do about a uh, China that's becoming increasingly united. We'll deal with that more in the next episode, the next uh, section, I should say. But the key thing is that we have to understand is that China is becoming more powerful and that's making the Japanese nervous because they would like to gain access to Chinese natural resources and food. And that's going to be harder if China is more powerful. So again, we have this sense of anxiety, this sense of fear. A lot of Japanese in the 1920s are going to be trying to deal with this issue through democracy, though. Right. These are concerns that people have, but it's not making them say, let's get rid of the system. There's a few people who say that, but the vast majority of Japanese uh, who have power, who are part of this uh, Japanese society, even those who don't have much power, they are quite willing to work within the system to deal with these problems. I now would like us to look at a person, though, who will be incredibly important in terms of the movement away from democracy to militarism, a man named Kita Iki. Right, so this is someone who's going to be helping to tilt things away from democracy, who says, I do have a problem with democracy. I think we need to do something else. What's curious, though, is that his something else is not radical left-wing politics like communism or anarchism. Rather, it is, in a sense, another restoration of the emperor. It is more right-wing and nationalist, though it also is in some ways socialist, but a socialism in a sense that serves the emperor system. So Kita Iki starts off with an early interest in socialism. He maintains that interest in a sense while becoming more nationalist. So you could say he is a national socialist, right? He's a nationalist who wants Japan and the Japanese nation to be the foremost loyalty of Japanese people. 
But he also thinks that in some way socialism might help Japan and might help the Japanese people better serve the emperor. Akita Iki is interesting because he argues that liberal elites, including capitalists, uh, were together in an alliance that had hijacked the Meiji Restoration by controlling the emperor. So he doesn't want to get rid of the emperor and the emperor system. Rather, he argues that the emperor, uh, not just the Meiji emperor, but the Taisho, and of course later uh, Hirohito, known as the Showa emperor, that they were all under the control of liberal elites, politicians, and capitalists, and that they, those elites, those capitalists, were running the nation to benefit themselves. So Kita Iki was concerned with rural poverty. He was concerned with the plight of the workers. He was concerned with all those issues that concerned socialists. But his answer was not communism or anarchism or anything like that. His answer was that the military, which he saw as the classless servants of the nation, as people who did not care about their economic class or anything like that, but only cared about serving the good of the nation, he wanted the military to sweep away those liberal elites, those politicians, those capitalists, those bankers, all those people, those corporations, wanted them to be swept away so that the emperor could truly rule. Then, once that had been carried out, Japan could help liberate China from being dominated by the Western powers and defeat the white empires in a coming race war. Right, He wanted uh, to, res to have this transformation in Japan to get the emperor to really be in charge with the help of the military. Japan could then help liberate China and defeat the white empires in a coming race war. So one thing that's interesting is he actively supported the Chinese Revolution of 1911 and 1912, and he criticized his own government's China policy, which he saw as unfair to Chinese people and to China. So Kita Iki is a, is a fascinating person because he was a real believer that Japan needed to be more respectful and treat China more like an equal rather than beating up on China. And we'll talk more in the next section how Japan is going to beat up on China. He thought that was wrong. And in part, he wanted a revolution in Japan in order to change its China policy so that China and Japan could work together against the white empires in this coming race war. So his thinking is, is really fascinating because on one side, he is a Japanese person who's willing to look at Chinese as their equals and who wants to help the poor. But its foundation is this anti-white, in a sense, racism uh, that, that predicts this coming race war. And he's writing down these ideas and they're going to become kind of a blueprint in many ways for what's going to happen next in Japan and, in a sense, the destruction of Japan's democracy as a real institution. Now, one thing I want to point out is that a person who wrote a really good book on Kito, Kita Iki is a man named uh, Dr. George Wilson. I like to mention Dr. Wilson because he trained me when I studied Japanese history. I, I took some classes with him. Uh, I always am very thankful to him because he was not only a great professor, but I remember he was taking a group of graduate students to another university to visit a friend of his and sit on his graduate class. And he said to me, oh, we've got an empty seat. Would you like to come too? Because I know that you really like this class and you're interested in Japanese history. And so I was so touched. You know, I'm just, uh, at the time I was an undergraduate, I think I was a junior, and to have a professor notice me and to invite me to come along with all these graduate students to, to go into this graduate class, to me that was so cool and so exciting. Uh, and unfortunately he uh, has passed away. And curiously, that's the only photo like I could find on it, of him on the internet, which is from his uh, uh, funeral website. But awesome professor, wrote a very interesting book about Kita Iki. And I'm gonna quote from Kita Iki's An Outline Plan for the Reorganization of Japan. Right, so Iki is thinking about these solutions to Japan's problems while mainstream Japan is trying to, to uh, deal with these problems by expanding democracy, right? And that's one thing that makes this section a little bit difficult to kind of follow, but I hope you'll bear with me, is that you've kind of got two Japans. You've got one Japan that thinks every, that has confidence and faith in the system of democracy to overcome Japan's problems. The problems are the same. You've got another part of Japan that says, no, we need something radical, we need something different. 
You've got the communists who say we need something different, the anarchists who we say we need something different, and Kita Iki who says we need something different. Kita Iki's ideas are the ones that will eventually, in a sense, overthrow democracy in Japan, though. But here is part of Kita Iki's ideas. The movements of the universe are orderly. Nations rise and nations fall. In historical progress, both east and west, we find a collective unification of the feudal state after a period of warring states. Similarly, the world peace that will come after the present period of international warring states must necessarily be a feudal peace supported by the strongest state. So he predicts a major war coming up, but this war will end with unification by the strongest state. By the way, he means Japan. And you can see this is actually referring to the Tokugawa period in a sense. It's saying, you know, the Tokugawa unified Japan, and now Japan will unify the world. So he has this kind of mystic uh, idea of Japan's uh, kind of coming greatness, in a sense, and its mission to unify the world. And in his ideas, and there's Dr. Wilson's uh, book right there, Radical Nationalists in Japan, he has a justification for war. The present state of affairs is definitely unjust. England is a multi-billionaire standing over the whole world. Russia is the great landlord of the Northern Hemisphere. Japan is in the position of an international proletarian. If you're not familiar with that ter term, it is a kind of communist socialist term that means the workers who are being oppressed and who are the good people who need to bring revolution. With a string of small islands for boundaries. Does Japan not have the right to go to war and seize their monopolies in the name of justice? Right, so Kita Iki looks at the world and says, England and Russia are bad, they're oppressing all the other countries. Japan, on the other hand, is good, but look, because of their oppression, we are limited to a very small area. We have the right to fight them and to expand in the name of justice. And it's fascinating that he's borrowing this kind of socialist communist language, but instead of applying it to social classes, is applying it to these different nations, right? To say that like Russia and England are like the capitalists who are oppressing everyone, and Japan's like the proletarian workers who need to overthrow the old unjust order and set up a new just one. He would go on to write, after destroying England in Asia, he means they're not going to actually invade England, he just means they're going to kick the English out of Asia, and restoring Turkey. After making India independent and China autonomous, the rising sun flag of Japan shall offer the light of that sun to all mankind. The second coming of Christ, prophesied in every country on earth, actually signifies the scripture and sword of Japan as a new Muhammad. Right, So you can see this kind of mystical view he has of what Japan should be and its mission in the world. The Japanese people must soon face a national crisis unprecedented in history. It will come as a result of reorganizing the state's political and economic structure. That's that revolution. Peace without war is not the way of heaven. So Kita Iki sees a great peace coming, but before that, there's going to be a big war that will come about because Japan is going to go reorganize its system and overthrow the evil Western countries, the white powers that are oppressing humanity. And then once that is done, Japan will lead the world into a new age. But first, Japan must be reorganized, right? Japan must be reorganized. And of course, Kita Iki sees it as the military that needs to do that reorganization. Now, here's the key thing. 1910s, 1920s, not that many people are paying all that much attention to Kita Iki. There's a few people reading his book. But that's not the main thing people are focusing on. People still have a faith in democracy. That's still the dominant perspective of the Japanese people. What changes the situation is the depression. Japan, remember, is resource poor comparatively, not self-sufficient in food, so it was highly dependent on the international market. Japan needs to import raw materials, manufacture stuff out of those raw materials, and sell them to make sure it can get the resources and the food it needs in order to survive. So Japan was highly dependent on the international market. The 1929 stock market crash in the United States will lead, though, to a worldwide depression that leads to a severe contraction of international trade. So that's really bad for Japan. Japan relies on international market, and that market is getting smaller. It's contracting. It's going to be difficult for Japan to get what it needs. So to give you an example of what hurts Japan, right? Between 1929 and 1931, the price of basic agricultural crops will drop by 43%. 43%. 
So what that means then, if you're a farmer, your income just dropped by about half. Now, imagine if you're a farmer and you owe money and your land is your collateral, how can you pay back that money when your income drops almost by half? You're not going to be able to pay it back. So the eviction rate for farmers, that farmers losing their land, is going to go from 5% in the early 1920s to 50% in the Depression. One thing, just as a quick aside, I should note, generally the military were drawn from the ranks of the people in the country, especially the officers uh, tended because the countryside was poor. If you were a poor country person who wanted to kind of raise your status, you would join the army. And so the army was particularly concerned about this, these problems. The jobless rate for people, uh, so this would be like urban workers, is 15 or 20 percent or more. So unemployment strike. Uh, skyrockets. Japan tried to deal with this problem by exporting, export more goods, but foreign protectionism, basically tariffs, will prevent Japan from doing this. Basically a tariff is when you put a tax on goods you're bringing into the country. And what will happen is in order, when the Great Depression occurs, people are going to be out of work, so governments will increase tariffs on foreign goods so that domestic workers can hopefully keep their jobs. They won't be put out of business by cheap foreign goods. That makes it hard for Japan. So the d democratic government, I won't go into detail here why, is not able to really deal with this situation all that effectively, right? It's not able to, to help as much as many people think it should. And the international situation is not helping. So many Japanese people start to turn in and say, we need to worry about just, uh, if we can't get things internationally, Japan needs to figure out to get them itself. And if democracy is not going to fix things, we need something else to fix it. Right? So there's this being a turning away from the international system because it's not working to give Japan what it needs and a turning away from democracy. The West isn't really doing much either to help Japan and to help maintain Japanese democracy. Uh, there are things that maybe could have been done. Uh, there was a failed effort in many ways, I think, to understand the Japanese perspective. So, for example, uh, there was a, uh, what's called the Washington Naval Conference in 1922. This was an effort to limit the building of naval ships in order to prevent an arms buildup and another world war. The idea was that the previous World War had been started in part, talking about World War I, by an arms race. And then if we prevent an arms race, we can prevent war. And also, building ships and things like that is expensive, and that costs money that we could use on other uh, infrastructure projects. You know, building a naval ship, that's great. It gives people jobs. But you know what? Building roads also gives people jobs, and those roads can benefit people in other ways. So why don't we do that? However... As part of this deal, there was a, they had to fix the tonnage ratio. The Washington Naval Conference included three major powers that we're going to be focusing on, the United States, Great Britain, and Japan. Now, um, there, tonnage is a measurement of ships, but basically I'm just going to convert this into ships just to make it a little similar. For every five ships that the United States had, Navy, the British could have five, and the Japanese could only have three. Now, logically speaking, from the uh, British and the American perspective, we had to maintain fleets in the Atlantic and the Pacific, whereas Japan only had to maintain a fleet in the Pacific. So from our perspective, we said, okay, this is fair because we have to have more ships because we have more stuff to worry about. We have to cover more territory. Now, some Japanese people disagreed with this and said, look, uh, you guys, what prevents you from taking your ships from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean and beating up on us? But in any case, this country of Japan at this time, it's a democracy, uh, they see the wisdom of this, and they accept this. In 1930, there was another naval conference, the London Naval Conference, and it was time to renegotiate this tonnage ratio. And the Japanese proposed a 10-10-7. So for every 10 American ships, there would be 10 British ships and 7 Japanese ships. So if you do your math, Japan's getting a little bit of a bump up. But you would still have American and British dominance. Now, in my opinion, I think this would have been a perfect chance for the Americans and the British to say, yeah, let's throw the Japanese a bone. Let's give them something, right? Japan's got some issues with the Great Depression, don't we all? But, you know, we need to really support them. They're trying to be a democracy. They're not asking for much. Why don't we just give it to them? 
let's give them that extra half a ship is basically what Japan is asking for. The Americans and the British don't do that. They refuse to do that. Japan does not get those extra ships. They're not allowed to build those extra ships. And a Japanese nationalist will actually assassinate then Hamaguchi Osachi, the prime minister you can see there. Uh, he will shoot Hamaguchi. Hamaguchi will linger on for about a month or so and then die. And this is very sad. It also represents Japanese frustration with that they see as the hypocrisy of the West. They say these Western people, they got all the power and they don't want to share any of it. And they won't recognize our growing strength. They won't respect us. We need to do something, right? We need to do something. So there's this increasing frustration with what the Japanese see as the hypocrisy of the West. And even if we're not going to use this word hypocrisy, I, I, like I, I want to just stress that diplomatically speaking, I think the uh, um, United States and Great Britain could have been more understanding of Japan's circumstances, right? They could have been a little bit more understanding of Japan's situation. So we will see mounting frustration with Japan's weak democracy and its inability, it would seem, to deal with the West, to deal with the problems Japan faces uh, both domestically and in terms of foreign relations. Now, in one sense, it is a bit unfair to call this democracy weak. As we'll see, the democracy, in order to survive, needs support. It needs the support of its military. It needs support of its people. This is a constitutional monarchy. It needs the support of its emperor. When those are withdrawn, of course, it's going to fall apart. Now, I do want to point out that the Japanese democracy, in a sense, was weak. If it had been able to deal with these situations, we wouldn't have the rise to power of the military, which will do a terrible job of directing Japan. We'll see that more in the next section, but military government of, of Japan is, is incompetent and terrible, we'll see. And it's unfortunate, in a sense, for both Asia, Japan, and the rest of the world that the democracy, in a sense, was weak because they will not be able to stop the rise of the military which is frustrating because supposedly democracy is weak and can't deal with the West and with its foreign problems or the domestic problems. As we'll see, the Japanese military is not able to deal with them either. But I digress. We're, we're going back now to emphasize there's this growing frustration with the Japanese democratic government. A lot of it is among the military many members of which are reading the works of Kita Iki, right? Kita Iki has this blueprint for revolution in which Japan will have its uh, new government established in a sense. It will have a true restoration in which the military would kick out the capitalists, the bankers, uh, the politicians, all these people who are just self-serving and selfish and who don't really care about the country. Patriot Japanese soldiers will kick those guys out restore the emperor to true power, and go on to liberate Asia in a great holy war, which will then allow Japan to take its proper, predominant place in the world. But in order for all that to happen, you've got to have that revolution within the government. So people inspired by these kinds of ideas will do things like assassinating prime ministers. Between 1921 and 1936, Three serving and two former prime ministers were assassinated. Now, remember, in this system of government, a prime minister is very similar to a president. So imagine if between 1921 and 1936, three American presidents that were ser currently serving and two who had already been president were assassinated. That's similar to what's going on in Japan here. There were also attempts on two others. And I, I, I go into deep detail on this in my History 376 class on Modern Japan. But there were multiple such incidents that didn't just target prime ministers, but that also targeted lots of other high officials and business leaders and even the owners of newspapers. So through, from 1921 to 1936, with an uptake after 1929, there are all these incidents in which people, Japanese people, usually army or navy officers are assassinating democratically elected officials, right? Officials who gain their power from being having uh, won elections and so forth. So this is an attack on democracy, 
right? There are multiple attacks on democracy, not just in terms of like criticism, but I mean like shooting democratically effect elected officials. However, instead of actually defending democracy, people will turn against it. Japanese courts will only give light sentences to those military uh, officials, or military officers who kill these politicians. Right. So can you imagine that you kill a democratically elected official and you hardly get any prison sentence at all? That is generally what happened. The courts are very reluctant to give any kind of heavy punishment to these military officials, military officers who were killing these democratically affected people like Prime Minister Inukai there. You can see him there. He was uh, in that picture on the right. He was a Japanese prime minister who was doing his best to prevent war but he will be killed. The courts in this sense though are responding to public sympathy. There are many Japanese people who think that these uh, assassins, these soldiers and, and Navy personnel who are going around killing democratically elected officials, they think uh, that those people are good. They think they're sincere. And so there's massive public sympathy, not for the prime ministers who are being killed, but for the soldiers who are killing them. And to give you one example, in one case, a, a petition with tens of thousands of names on it is submitted asking that some of these assassins be given light sentences, be treated leniently by Japanese citizens. So all these Japanese citizens, uh, tens of thousands of them, sign a petition asking that assassins who killed a prime minister be given light sentences or be given no sentence. You may say, well, what's the big deal about, you know, having a petition with tens of thousands of names on it? I mean, Japan's a country of millions. This is the big deal. The signatures were written in blood. The signatures were written in blood. Tens of thousands of Japanese people wrote their names in blood asking that these officials, that these military officers who killed democratically elected officials be pardoned, to have a light sentence. 11, uh, in this particular case, there were 11 military officers who were being put on trial. 11 young men cut off a finger, and each of them sent their fingers, they sent them all together, to the government saying, please execute us instead of those 11 assassins. As a measure of our sincerity, we offer you our fingers. So the public was very sympathetic to these military officers. The emperor, Hirohito, the Showa emperor, refuses to intervene. The prime minister who serves him gets assassinated and Hirohito will not criticize the assassins, who by the way are acting in his name. He doesn't do it, he doesn't uh, criticize them. If he would have done that, that could have put an end to all this. But Hirohito preferred the government, or preferred the military Hirohito supported the military because they said he was, uh, they thought he was awesome and they, they wanted to act in his name. So Hirohito is going to support the military and not criticize them for killing his prime ministers and other government officials. So the democracy in a sense in Japan will fall. Now what's really weird is they still will vote and they'll still like have a, a diet. It's just it won't have any power, right? Increasingly, it will not have any power. So, again, it's, and this, I, I really have to highlight this, that the democracy fell in part because the courts would not punish people who acted against the democracy, who actually assassinated officials. Public sympathy was in favor of the assassins, in part because democracy had trouble dealing with all these serious problems. And the emperor refused to really come out against the assassins who were acting supposedly in his name and so forth. So this will lead for democracy in a sense to fall and for the military to rise to power because you know that if you want to restrain the military, no one's going to help you, right? If you're a Japanese official and you want to restrain the military, you know that the government, the rest of the government officials, the courts will not um, support you and the public, if the government, if the uh, military does assassinate you, the public will applaud the assassins. So there's just not much democracy can do. The military will rise to power. In the next section, 
we will see how terrible a job the Japanese military does, right? They're successful at getting power, getting rid of democracy in a sense. They're going to be terrible at actually dealing with Japan's problems. I like to try and give as much detail as possible. It's difficult to do that in this class because of all that we need to cover. But I want us to really understand the human side of things. Right, so I, I like to sometimes talk about individual lives. So I want to talk about a guy named Takahashi Korekio, right? Takahashi Korekio. He gives us a sense of the tragedy of this rise of militarism and the fall of democracy. Takahashi Korekio was a former prime minister of Japan and a longtime finance minister. He actually played a, a key role in helping Japan's economy not do worse than it actually did in the Great Depression. Right. So it's kind of sad because people are going to be critical of his economic policies because Japan did not do well after the Great Depression. But his economic policies prevented Japan from doing worse than it would otherwise have done. Right. So I, I feel bad for the guy. He did a good job, but no one recognized him in a sense for it for it. But before that, right, he was key to obtaining foreign loans during the Russo-Japanese Wars. Right. Japan, in order to defeat Russia, needed to borrow money on the international banking market. And Japan actually had a really hard time doing that because a lot of people thought Russia would win. And if Russia defeated Japan, how could Japan pay back the loan? So like no one wanted to loan Japan money. But Takahashi Korikio is going to play a key role in actually getting Japan to be able to borrow money. One thing also interesting about the guy was he lived in the United States and had actually learned English. So uh, if I recall correctly, a year before the Meiji Restoration, he actually went to Oakland, California and studied English a bit and, and then later came back and would, would use his English to eventually serve the government. Uh, incidentally, he was also, I think, one of only two Christians to serve as prime minister of Japan. So very fascinating guy, very, very interesting. He was also very perceptive. And in 1936, he said this. While he was finance minister, our country is poor in natural resources, and I doubt that we can compete in an autarkic economic environment. What he means by that is an economic uh, environment based on just having a Japanese empire that could fulfill all its needs. He's emphasizing we can't do this. We need to rely on international trade. Right? We need to rely on international trade. Things are going well with it, but we can fix it. We must think of our position in the world and form a budget in keeping with our people's wealth. In other words, we need to acknowledge Japan is not the Soviet Union. Japan is not the United States. We need to understand that there are limits to what we can do because of material restraints we face. Right? We need a budget that the Japanese people can actually support. Right? We can't spend, and I want to stress, he in this he is talking about, he's reacting to the military saying we want more money. He's saying... We don't got the money to give you. You need to lower your ambitions, and maybe we need to rely on diplomacy and not the military for our foreign relations. Financial trust is an intangible. Maintaining that trust is our most urgent duty. So we need to make sure our health is our economy is in good health, so we can keep good credit. Right? No one's going to loan us money. Uh, no one's going to help us out with our problems unless we can play nice with other countries. Maintaining that trust is our most urgent duty. If we focus only on defense, we will cause bad inflation and that trust will collapse. Right? We have to build a rich country, strong army. It's that order. If you try and build a strong army before you have a rich, rich country, it won't work. You'll end up with a bad country, or I'm sorry, you'll end up with a bad army and a poor country. We have to build up our economy then we can talk about having a bigger military budget. Thus, our national fence will not be secure. The military should think about this. Right, so he's basically arguing publicly that the military is asking for too much money, for more money than Japan can afford, and therefore the military needs to rethink its priorities and it needs to be realistic about what Japan can actually do. Right, he's saying this in 1936. In the 1936 incident, which is another one of these incidents in which the military will assassinate democratically uh, connected officials, according to uh, the description in 
SCM Payne's The Wars for Asia, which is a fantastic book, and I highly encourage you to read it. This is what is going to happen to Takahashi Korekio. Soldiers broke into his home, found him in bed, cut him off mid-sentence, so he actually tried to defend himself and explain himself, and shot and slashed him to death while screaming, Heavenly Punishment! Apparently, limits to military spending constituted a sin against heaven. And so what happens is this perceptive man, very intelligent person, courageous, who wanted Japan to follow a reasonable, practical route in its, both its domestic and foreign affairs, is killed for speaking out for saying what was true, that Japan needed to be careful, right? That Japan needed to be careful. They didn't have the budget to deal with, uh, to, to handle what the military was asking for. The military should therefore restrain itself and Japan need to figure out another way forward. However, sadly, the anxieties by this time had gotten so great, the fears of Japanese people had gotten so great that in the end, they celebrated and accepted and supported the military, even as it killed men like Takahashi Korikio. And I like that picture. I chose that picture on the right on purpose because it shows him, you know, as a, as a doting grandfather, right? Someone, again, a, a, fa a person with a family, right? A human being. And for trying to help his country and to be a responsible global citizen, he is killed. As we will see in the next section, his killers are quite incompetent. They don't know how to run a country. And they will drive Japan and all of Asia to ruin. And also kill a lot of Americans in the process, as well as others. Now, I think you may notice in this section, uh, I think I'm a little bit more emotional than I am in other sections. Um, I need to stress that this is not because I am anti-Japanese. Rather, it's because I'm rather pro-Japanese. Uh, I love studying Japanese history. Uh, I have a lot of good relationships, close relationships with Japanese friends. And uh, I just hate uh, this period of history because you see this tragic turning away from what I would argue is the good, a good route forward, a democratic route. And you see it being shifted towards this militaristic route that's going to kill a lot of people and create a lot of human misery like I said, by people who just don't know what they're doing and who are incompetent and kill people who do know what they're doing. Uh, so not a big fan of militarism, big fan of democracy, so that, uh, and a big fan of Japan. So that's why I uh, get a little emotional and frustrated when I teach this lecture. Hope it didn't make it hard to follow.